my goodness. Hey guys, it's Joel and welcome back to the channel and to another Bruce Lee Honest review today with this gorgeous BMW 125i Cabriolet. Now it's crazy to think the BMW 1 series as a platform has been around for 20 years now, in fact, since 2004. And in its conception, it was a very different looking thing to this. And that has evolved over the years, mostly in its hatchback format to something completely different today. It looks more like a MPV. However, between 2008 and 2013, they created some beautiful one series coupes and one series cabriolets like this one here today. And we all know about the 1M coupe, which is famed amongst petrol heads and journalists as being one of the greatest BMWs ever made. That was in this very format. But as these cabriolets were only produced for around five years from 2008 to 2013 before it was replaced by the two series, there's not actually many of them around. It's hard to find exact numbers online, but I know that in this guise with the six speed manual as a cabriolet with the three litre but detuned 25i engine, there's only six currently for sale on Auto Trader and three in a similar M Sport spec to this. So they're actually quite hard to come by. And if you've been watching the channel for a little while now, you may recognize this car because it has actually featured on this very YouTube channel before. And that's because this car belongs to my father. Now he's had this for a couple of years now and he absolutely loves it. But the main thing that he was drawn to with this, other than it being a soft top convertible, which he adores and he had in his previous E85 Z4, it was the price. It is a lot of car for not much money. And that is a common theme actually with these recent Bruce Lee Honest reviews, like the Range Rover we had on last week. That is a lot of car for not much money. But these do represent something slightly different in the sense that they are quite rare. He was very much drawn to this one in particular due to the mineral gray paintwork, which we all like, it looks great on any BMW really, but also the red leather interior. Again, quite rare to find, but actually a really tasteful spec and one that I would personally go for as well. Now, of course it's subjective and I would love to hear your thoughts down in the comment section below, but I do think that these E82 generation and E88 is the Cabriolet generation one series are quite good looking cars. What you probably can't really tell from the camera shots is it's quite small. It's very thin, it's very short, and it's very well proportioned actually. It's much more difficult on smaller cars, I think, to make them better proportioned, but they did a very good job with this one series back in the day. As you'll notice, this is a late 2010 model or a very, very early facelift. Now, they did facelift these cars for the, the 2011 model year. They got updated rear lights with an LED, front lights as well, and a slightly lower and more aggressive bumper. And I think also that front bumper is a really, really lovely design. You could just look at it for hours actually, because it's so, purposeful unlike the newer bmws they're making today which have just got a very sort of flat dull emotionless sort of styling to them this really is one of the better looking bmws in my opinion and still does look fantastic today so whilst we're outside the car then let's have a quick look underneath the bonnet at the engine because despite this car's model designation being the 25i i actually thought that meant it had a 2.5 litre engine but it does not, it has the exact same N52 three litre block that the 30i has. And did you know that this was the first water-cooled engine to use magnesium composite in the construction of the engine block? I didn't know that either. I just literally found that on Google a second ago. But joking aside, this N52 was and is um, notoriously one of BMW's great engines, a bit like the M54, uh, slightly older three litre engine. That and the N62, I think, uh, two of the great engines. There's very, very few common and bad issues with these cars. On the turbo version of these, like the 35i, for example, there are more things that do go wrong with those. And the other good thing about this is that it is exactly the same engine as the 30i, like I say, but it is just detuned. So it's probably, if anything, slightly less stretched out than the 30i's would be. However, 260 horsepower in the 30i is not really too much for an engine of that size. But this one here has been detuned to around, I think it's 218 horsepower, 200 pounds foot of torque, which doesn't sound like an awful lot, and we'll see how that feels when we're behind the wheel a little bit later on. I've not actually driven this car yet. However, there's not that much car to shift, so surely it should do the job very nicely. I do hear as well that 
this gets a very easy 33, 34 miles per gallon. My dad's usual driving. He's not a speed demon, but he doesn't drive like Miss Daisy either. So that's probably quite a representative figure of what you might expect with one of these 25i N52s. But I can't imagine it'd be much different with a 30i anyway. But yeah, fantastic engine. And you can just get these remapped back up to that 30i power that BMW originally made them with and not have to worry about it straining the engine. So that's another bonus with these cars because they can be bought slightly cheaper than the 30i counterparts. But as I mentioned, the main reason my dad went for this was because of the spec, not just cosmetically with the color and the interior, but also the options it's got inside. So with that, let's jump inside. Let's have an in-depth look at the inside of the car. This one also has the iDrive and the LCI screen as well, so the larger ones. There's quite a lot of functionality in there, as there is with all of this era of BMW. And then we'll take it out for a drive and see what it's all about. And hopefully, hopefully the weather holds off and we can get the, get the roof down as well. Okay, so jumping in the E88 1 Series then, and yeah, first impressions are it feels snug, but I suppose that's what you expect when you look at it from the outside, as it is quite a small car. The seating position is great, and these M Sport seats, which obviously came with this level of trim as standard, are extremely supportive. In fact, they feel quite intrusive, not quite what I'm used to in my daily driver, which is a Porsche KN. Steering wheel is always in a perfect position before you make any adjustments in a BMW. They always get this right. Though I am just noticing, I thought that was the clutch pedal, but actually it's the footrest. The pedals are slightly over to the right, maybe by about 10 degrees or so. That's normally something saved for older Lamborghinis and Ferraris, but here they are very slightly angled too. But the interior presents really well, and I have to say, to be honest, I did help my dad when choosing uh, these cars, not with this particular one, but the leather and just all of the interior materials and trim is in fantastic condition. Quite remarkable considering that this car is 14 years old. I believe it's got around 85,000 miles on the clock as well, so it's no garage queen, but everything from the sun visors to the roof itself to this interesting metallic effect trim to the soft touch plastic steering wheel and especially the red stitch leather look fantastic actually really really obviously well made good quality and has been looked after which is always nice to see i do find it immediately pleasing and slightly nostalgic seeing the classic analog bmw dials this of course is before things went digital actually with bmw that was quite late i remember my m240i i got that because it was the facelift where they first brought the digital dials in on the two series and that was a 2017 late 2017 car i believe so we're a long way off digital dials but it is lovely to see the analog the only thing that seems to be missing is i have my fuel gauge on the right on the rev counter at the bottom um, but we're missing some sort of water or oil temperature on the lower part of the speedo i had that in my z4 and i've noticed that in quite a few other models of bmws around this age so for some reason we don't have a gauge but perhaps that's because we have an ability to view it in the iDrive system which we'll look at slightly later. Because the cabin is quite small and because this is a BMW everything is within very easy reach of the driver. In fact this central area here with the air conditioning, heated seats, CD player etc is slightly angled towards me and we've got the lights on this side, gear knobs really nicely placed and everything you need is literally so close you don't need to look away, you don't need to move around much to get anything you want to access. Now, as I mentioned, this car is really quite well specced, actually. Uh, not only do I love the red leather and think that that adds to any car and makes it feel a little bit more special, let's say, it does seem to have some nice options. Like this M Sport gear knob, we have individual controls for each electric window because there are two smaller rear ones as well, electronic wing mirrors. But what I do like is there's one button where we control all four windows at once should we wish. Sadly, these seats are not electronically operated. That's probably one option that is missing and one that I certainly would value. We have manual controls for that and they're not particularly adjustable. You can go forwards and backwards as you might expect. You can go up and down very ungracefully and you can of course adjust the backrest. We do then have some bolster and lumbar support and actually listen, I could play with that all day. And then the steering wheel itself feels very chunky. I think with this being an M Sport model, the wheel was slightly chunkier to start with. And it is showing signs of wear this particular one. But yeah, you really do have to try to grip your hands 
around it and I'm not sure how much I like that. I think I've become used to thinner rimmed cars um, and this will take a little bit of getting used to. Feels reassuringly chunky though, like the rest of the car. We then have indicators and the computer control switch here and below it, cruise control, which I know was a real essential for my dad um, with this car. And one of the reasons he chose this, because I don't believe this was a standard option. We then have fingertip controls for controlling your audio and also going through some menus here on the right hand side. We can adjust this steering wheel, but there's no fancy electronics like in the Range Rover we featured last week. But yeah, we can go up, down, in and out. And like I say, when I stepped in the car, actually, it was just positioned in such a way that I wouldn't really mess around with that at all. In terms of storage, considering the size of the car and it being quite small in here, there's a fair amount. The glove box over here is relatively generous. You could get a few things in there. In fact, let's see what my dad's got in his glove box. He's got a torch. He's got... What on earth is that? A 28 in one mini ratchet set. He's got some gloves. He's got a Mars bar. God knows how long that's been in there. And some weird cigarette port plug adapter. That's quite handy actually. Um, so you can see there's a fair amount of stuff in there and there's room for more too. We have a tiny little compartment here which houses the cigarette uh, lighter port as well. And in the middle we have a split compartment tiny bit of storage underneath literally just enough for some hand sani and then if we put that down we've got a little tray here which i think would be where the mobile phone went if you had that optioned uh doesn't look like this car did maybe it did actually there's a little plug socket there maybe this did have the mobile phone at one point huh well, my dad just uses it for uh some glasses and <laughs> cats out the bag a dog color my dad is actually a man of the cloth um, or a vic would be the more respectable way to say it yeah and some pens that's pretty good but yeah you can't get oh my goodness me underneath this storage area slash armrest is this pouch which i don't know if that's factory fitted it feels like it is um, but that would be perfect for let's say an iphone let's give it a test gosh iphones are massive now i don't think iphones were this big back in 2010 when this car was made but yeah that will just about fit my massive iphone pro max or whatever that one is and then we do have an augs input a usb port and another 12 volt cigarette lighter um, which conveniently has another two usb ports with the adapter that my dad has chosen and um, given the size of the car it's uh it's quite quite adequate actually door bins are quite long not particularly deep or wide but should we have a look at what my dad's got in his door bin a brush and some interior detailer and more glasses bless him so the storage is pretty adequate when you consider the size of the car in fact quite impressive and well thought out too but then you do have to remember this is not just a two-seater sports car it's actually a four-seater there are two additional seats in the back so i suppose i'll have to see how roomy it is back there in a moment but first in the front of the car i just want to pop the ignition on and have a little play with the iDrive because this is the facelifted iDrive. It's got the newer iDrive wheel and slightly more functionality than previous models, but it wasn't always specced in these one series. So it's another optional extra that's quite nice on this car. So of course, with this era of BMW, you've got this very futuristic thin key, which slots into the dash like this and gives us some basic electronics. And we can have a little play then with the iDrive. So let me go to the menu button and see what it presents us. Let me scroll down to vehicle information, see if that gives us anything about the temperature of the car, because as I said, it's missing it from the dashboard. It looks like we've only got engine oil level, tire pressure, flat tire monitor, our service schedule, which I've always actually quite liked on these BMWs. It makes it very easy to keep track of. It's a good thing to check when you're buying a car as well and any warning lights and their information but it doesn't look like we've actually got any information about the temperature of the car so it does seem to just be missing altogether and actually just scrolling through here i do have to say i'm quite surprised at this it's very responsive very fast it's actually quicker to respond than the latest software on the on the new range rover that is really cumbersome and a bit like one of those seat back tvs you get on an airplane you know where you're touching the movie that you want and then it selects one four further down that you're not interested in whereas this is actually really responsive i think that's partly because it's not touchscreen and uh, it's controlled through this wheel here which 
hate it or love it, these iDrive systems, they are very intuitive, or at least this later one is, and you can actually do quite a lot with them. We have a sat nav on this car as well, which is actually quite up to date. And I have to say the graphics are very impressive considering this thing is 14 years old. Uh, I'm, I'm quite pleasantly surprised by that. It looks very up to date and it does have certain functions such as accident and uh, traffic reports too, which is very, very impressive. So as well as having a CD player and a radio and telephone connection ability, you can actually stream audio uh, through Bluetooth to the car from your phone. So you don't need to necessarily use that aux input. You can, just like modern cars, connect your phone to the system and play music through the car's stereo, which is also a nice function. I think that was something my dad quite liked about this very early facelift car, is the ability to be able to do that. And then if we press the engine start stop button, we get some more electronics coming into life, like the air conditioning, which feels nice and ice cold, actually. We do also have heated seats which is a lovely thing to have, especially in a convertible, three settings of which we can choose from with those. And then very simple really, a button for the roof to go down, a button for the roof to go up, and a button control our parking sensors, of which this car has front and rear, which is very nice. But I find you don't really need them on this thing because it's so small and easy to place. Tell you what then, let's pop the roof down because I feel like that's gonna aid me quite a lot in getting in the back. And then realistically, we wanna go and drive this thing with the roof down, don't we? So mission on, let's see how long this takes. I'm gonna hold the button now. Windows go down first. And that did take quite a while actually, I'd say probably about 30 seconds. Uh, however, I believe in this car, you can do that up to 30 miles an hour. So it's rare that that's ever going to be a problem, apart from when you're trying to film a video and then there's just a, a large period of awkward silence. Right, let's jump in the back of the car, see how spacious or potentially unspacious it is, and see how viable this thing would be as an actual four-seater. Right, so I've just noticed there is obviously this wind deflector, which conveniently goes up and down easily like that. I'm sure that will come in handy later when we've got the roof down, but I can't get in the back of the car with it here. So I'm just gonna pop this out quickly. Let's rest it on the back there. And yeah, let's try jump in the car. So seat forwards and uh well this seat is presumably in my dad's driving position he's about five foot ten a bit like me oh is that all the way back i'm actually quite surprised by that i think this is the first time i've ever got into a sports car which is a four seater and it's not actually been completely horrendous like a 911 for example you you just literally cannot sit in the back it's it's kind of hilarious but i genuinely i'm not joking i've got knee room leg room it's quite upright, obviously, but I have actually got an adjustable headrest, which is equally surprising. There's an armrest here, but that's pretty redundant because the shape of the car and the side of the car actually comes in quite a lot. So that's the main restriction, I'd say. I'm sort of angled this way, and I haven't really got anywhere to go on this side. But in terms of legroom, and if I sit like this with my arm out the car, it's genuinely workable. You could do 30 minute journey in here quite happily i would say though with the roof up it's probably not going to be the same story because i don't think i'd be able to stick my arm here as much and i think the roof line would slope slightly onto my head but despite that i think this is actually very workable you've even got little nets on the back of the seats here to be able to store a couple of things uh, out your pockets which is very handy and i genuinely would say if you've got friends and you wanted to take them down the road to the pub 15, 20 minutes or so. If they're not really elderly and frail, um, you're not gonna have any problems getting in the back of here and then you're gonna be perfectly comfortable, especially if you can have the roof down on a day in the summer. Very impressive, it is actually a true four-seater. Right, so here we are in the 125i Cabriolet, and what can I say? I mean, I've been driving for about 10 minutes before I started the camera, and I'm really enjoying it. Despite this thing being a Cabriolet, it's pretty quiet in here. There's a little bit of a knocking coming from towards the rear right. I don't know if there's a ball joint or something. And then there is a really annoying rattle coming from the left, but that's actually 
this camera. Uh, I need to get that sorted, but yeah, that obviously the mount or something is on its way out. So if you can hear that, I do apologize, but it's not the car actually making that noise. I've got this manual gearbox, which I have to say, the throws and the feel of it um, is, is lovely. And I thought I would just start the review off with the roof up, um, as I'm being quite cocky with the weather. I don't think it's gonna rain. I think we can save the roof down part until a little bit later, but I'm really excited for that because I can hear notes of that six cylinder engine when I do get into sort of the higher rev range, around 3000 RPM, which is where we are now. You can hear that raspiness that is quite common with these six cylinder engines from BMW. It's a lovely, lovely, joyous sound. And I can only imagine with the roof off, we're gonna just get more of that coming through. It is a very unintimidating and approachable car to drive. Even the clutch feel and the use of the gearbox is extremely second nature. It doesn't really take any getting used to at all. And I can already feel exactly where the RPMs are and got a good sort of relationship with that throttle pedal, which means despite only driving this for 15 minutes, I can easily rev match. And here we are, second gear, 40 miles an hour. Let's give it a little bit of a... 7,000 RPM red line takes us up to 60 miles an hour and it pulls really nicely. 218 horsepower or so doesn't sound all that much, and today, really, it's not. However, a lot of power is actually all about how the car delivers it. And these engines and these BMWs, these six cylinder blocks, have always delivered the power in such a way that it feels quicker. I think it's because you get all of it right at the top of the red band, and so you wanna chase it, and. Yeah, it is such a lovely linear delivery which rewards you for going all the way up to the red line and just as such makes it feel sprightly. And then the handling, I was kind of expecting it from this quite large and chunky steering wheel to feel almost a little bit sloppy and cumbersome, but of course it's a BMW so that was never going to be the case and I'm very pleasantly surprised at quite how nimble and responsive the steering is. If I'm right in remembering, these facelift one series came with a newly revised electronic steering rack. I think the last of the hydraulic steering were in the years preceding this particular car, but I'm not wishing I had that hydraulic steering if this isn't that car because it feels extremely communicative and I don't feel like there's any misunderstanding between what I'm doing with the wheel and what the wheels are doing beneath me and how the car's responding it. It's all very nicely packaged and I've got a really good understanding of what the car's doing and where the limit is. And I feel like I could really push this thing straight out the box quite confidently. In second gear, it feels pretty fast actually. And the great thing about these sorts of cars and one like this 25i in particular, you know, we've only got 218 horsepower. On paper, that gives us an auto 60 time of 6.6 .6 seconds, which sounds underwhelming, but what it really means is that in reality, on these sorts of roads that we encounter mostly here in the UK, it's just right because I can be at the top of second gear, flooring it all the way to the red line, shifting into third without breaking the speed limit, which is actually so important. Usable power is far more exciting than what it can do a launch control 0 to 60 time in. Brakes feel really good too, as does that handling, it's razor sharp. And then when you wanna quiet and down things a little bit, like I say, we've got the six speed gearbox, I'm at 50 miles per hour now, just over 1500 RPM, and right now I'm doing 53 miles to the gallon. This thing is geared really nicely, I mean, even at 35 miles per hour I can remain in sixth, and I've still got enough power and torque there to keep me going. The engine doesn't feel at all laboured. It feels just really comfortable and extremely smooth. Okay, but what I wanna do now though is pop the roof down. Let's see if we can do it whilst we're still moving. Right. Press that button. And if I wasn't filming, I would have the windows all down, but for audio purposes, we'll leave them up. So, roof down and yeah, immediately actually. Oh, the noise is really good. Let's give it a little bit of a blast up to 50 miles per hour. 
it makes a great sound. I don't even have the wind deflector up, but even at 55, 60 miles per hour, it's very comfortable with nothing around my neck. I'm not getting any chills anywhere. It's really quite impressive, to be honest. So when you start to push the car, as I'm trying to do a little bit now, it does hold up pretty well. I mean, there's a fair amount of body roll and the traction light does like to come on frequently. I think the traction control is quite intrusive in this car, but I know that it's probably not a bad thing because when the rear end goes on one of these, it's quite difficult to catch. No limited slip diff on these one series. Don't think it was even uh, an option. I think probably the one M had it, but that was about it. Yeah, through those corners there, 50, 60 miles an hour, it grips tremendously well. The performance, like I say, is, is all you really need. You can stay in third gear all day long. There's no real need to downshift to second, and you certainly don't need to be going up into fourth for any reason. I just find myself asking the same questions, but again, for the money, is there anything that can do so much? I mean, we've got the roof down, which I have to say is really nice. I've not had this for a long time. It's beautiful, especially on roads like these where you have the trees arcing over the top. We can hear the soundtrack of that six cylinder BMW note behind us, which is just lovely, not too loud. I'm sure you could do lots of stuff with this exhaust. I mean, I did a back box delete back in the day on my Z4 with the M54 engine, and that sounded fantastic, but without it, it sounds great. I'm really comfortable. I've been driving for about an hour now, and I feel like I could do another hour without any issues whatsoever. And then here, look, when I do a 180, if you watch this, it's so agile and maneuverable. The turning circle on this thing is tiny. Let's give it another blast though. Just, yeah, half the power, half the pedal. Just enjoying those revs build. 7,000, third gear. And I'm just gonna stay in third gear now, into a corner. It responds so well. The body rolls, like I say, but I have no real inkling other than the slightly intrusive traction control that it's not gonna hang on. And I have to say, I've not owned a BMW or even driven one for quite a while, but they are really good. It's easy to forget how well these things are made and how much emphasis there is on the driver. So what could you buy instead of this then? Well, of course, the obvious choice would be a three series convertible but they're slightly heavier and not going to be as dynamic. And I don't think they have quite the same charm as one of these. That squat nature of this thing, it just reminds me of like a, a Jack Russell or like a tiny little dog that's like, Rah! or maybe you could have a newer two series, but I think they'd be a little bit numb in feel and you'd lose some of the character that this thing still retains. You could have a 986 or maybe even a 987 Boxster like that one that's just going past now, or like the one I used to own, but you've only got the two seats then, and, and as we saw earlier, those two in the back are actually usable. And of course, in a Boxster, you don't have the same levels of comfort as this thing. That is dynamically better, it handles flatter, but this grips more than you'll ever need it to, and it's got, again, the power is more than enough. I've also done all of that fast and fun driving for the last 20 minutes or so, and the fuel needles not even moved a touch. So yeah, for five or six grand, as an all-rounder goes, the roof down, you've got the comfort, you have got two seats, you've got a lovely sounding engine, but you've also got one that is capable of getting 40 miles per gallon. Name something else in the comments below that does all of those things. So I hope you've enjoyed this video. As always, please do contact me at the email on screen now or down in the description. If you have a car sat on the driveway that you would like to see me feature and review in one of these videos. Thanks to my dad for lending me the keys to his pride and joy for the day. I have, as you can see, really enjoyed it. And I'm not just saying it, I have genuinely been quite surprised by how much I've enjoyed driving this thing. Would I buy one? No, I don't think I would. I think I would probably have a two-seater sports car. I've got no real need for those two back seats, but maybe one day I will, and I would genuinely, genuinely consider one of these cars. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one very, very soon.